This week, we got the Thor Love and Thunder teaser trailer. I might add that it was actually pretty darn interesting. I think they made some uh, good choices as far as what they put into the teaser trailer. Basically, it was almost all Thor and the Guardians of the Galaxy. And here to talk with me about not only the teaser trailer, but is Thor Love and Thunder going to be the first bomb, as some people have predicted, for the MCU is my good friend Aaron Sparrow, comic book writer, writer for season four of Young Justice. The episode's out very soon, right? Uh, yeah, I think uh, next, uh, I think this um, this coming Thursday. Very nice. How are you doing, Aaron? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. So we have this teaser trailer. I think it's the fourth most viewed trailer in the first 24 hours in the history of YouTube. So obviously there are people at least that were excited to see what was in there, whether it was going to be cringe, whether it was going to be exciting stuff. And I do believe that the MCU probably delivered things that people are going to want to see. Yeah, whoever cut that trailer together knew what it would uh, knew what people needed to see to be excited. Uh, there's some there's some comedy in there. There's some you know good uh, good Thor stuff in there that looks uh, looks fun. Uh, you've got uh, you know for the comic book nerds, you've got uh, Tooth Grinder and Tooth Nasher. You know clearly uh, clearly in there. You know his two uh, his two Rams that uh, pull his chariot. Uh, so that's you know that's exciting for us uh, us comic book geeks. Uh, so yeah, and then, and there's a lot of Guardians in it. So they really focused on things that are popular uh, to kind of like hook people back in. Now, obviously, they've done a lot of changes to Thor, specifically in that last Avengers movie. He was kind of like a comedic side piece to the entire story, which I thought was a not great decision for the character of Thor moving forward. And it looks like he's going to have a, you know, one of those 1980s, 90s kung fu montages where he's working out, getting back in shape and trying to rediscover himself. I think that's a really good move to let people know that they acknowledge that they took some bad uh, ideas about the character and kind of getting back to something more resembling the the character that we all love to begin with. Yeah, the choice in Endgame where they they had him kind of like uh, depressed and, and overweight, and uh, you know I understand narratively why they why they did that, and and they got some comedy mileage out of it. Uh, but you know after the the sheer amount of of tragedy and and gravitas that he had in the previous film in Infinity War, it really felt out of place to me. Uh, so it's nice to see kind of a return to form and Thor going back to, you know, being, uh, you know, back to his old self. Uh, it looks like he's on a voyage of self-discovery, trying to figure out, you know, what his place in this universe is now that, uh, now that they've done the whole Avengers thing, they've defeated Thanos, uh, kind of looks like he's in, in retirement. And then, uh, we've got Gore, the God butcher coming, uh, and, uh, has to, has to pull him back in. So they're, they're doing a lot of interesting things in the trailer that, uh, that, that kind of make you want to see the movie. Uh, and they keep to a minimum the, the concerns that people have about this movie. The one thing I thought they were really smart about was not showing Tessa Thompson too much. We've heard that the King Valkyrie needs her queen is going to be a major part as far as the storyline and arc of this film. You get her for about, I don't know, half a second. It looks like she's in a boardroom meeting and you don't see her as Valkyrie. You don't see her as King Valkyrie. If you were to just to see this trailer and not know anything about it, you wouldn't even realize she was a part of the movie. Yeah, you wouldn't pay too much attention to it. Uh, I do think that she gets kind of a, a bad rap. I've seen the meme going around of, uh, you know, the many expressions of Tessa Thompson, and they're just taking that one shot of her looking bored in that meeting uh, and repeating it a bunch of times. Um, I don't think that's fair. I think that she was fun in the previous Thor movie, even though that movie was really divisive uh, amongst fans uh, with its tone and, and the sheer amount of comedy and the way that every, like, every important moment was undercut by a joke, you know, that, that sort of thing. Uh, but I think that she was her performance in it was good, and I think she was a likable character. Whether or not that will continue as they uh, they try to politicize, uh, you know, her and, and her search for a queen and and pushing, uh, you know, the uh, the LGBTQ uh, angles into stories, uh, I don't know if uh, if they'll keep that same character. But um, but hopefully they still give her some fun things to do. I think it was a very smart move to kind of put that character on the back burner, especially early when you're trying to build up enthusiasm, get people excited for the film. So you mentioned Thor Ragnarok, and I'm going to be honest, I hate that movie. As a Thor movie, I think it is absolute trash. But as a movie, I think it's fun, a zany adventure. I just don't think it really falls in line with the very first Thor movie. Certainly not Thor The Dark World. The total shift in it didn't make a whole lot of sense. And obviously they were kind of treating a lot of things as, as more of a joke than a, a serious storyline moving forward. You liked Ragnarok more than me, I'm assuming. I liked it. As a, I'm in the same boat you are. As a Thor movie, I don't really enjoy it. As just a movie, I think that it was fun. Uh, it had uh, it felt like a he like a well done He Man movie <laughs> more than a Thor movie. Um, 
you know, there's a lot of problems I have with it. For one thing, I have a problem with uh, them just absolutely fridging the Warriors three. And then, you know, we never even address that. Thor never finds out about it. Uh, you know, there's never any repercussions for that. Um, I think that I was so glad that Jamie Alexander's, uh, you know, schedule didn't allow her to appear in that movie. So they weren't able to just kill her off as well. So um, I, I think we are supposed to be getting some Sif in, in Love and Thunder. So that's nice. I, I'd like to see uh, like to see that character again. Um, unless they're going to, you know, pull a, a sexuality switch and all of a sudden she's going to be Valkyrie's queen. Uh, you know, <laughs> even though, you know, in every previous movie, she's been super horny for Thor. Um, yeah. So, you know, it just depends on where they go. But uh, uh, yeah, so I, Thor Ragnarok is a complicated bag for me. Um, I think the best thing that came out of it was Kate Blanchett just absolutely chewing the scenery as Hela. Uh, I thought she was fantastic um, and very entertaining to watch. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's a complicated uh, <laughs> film on my list. Yeah, I wasn't too uh, too keen on that one because I really liked the very first Thor movie. I think that's probably the most underrated movie in all the MCU. I think it's still top five in, in my list. I always enjoyed that particular version of Thor. Now, we did see, obviously, the very end, they, they show us Jane Foster as Thor. Looks like a big improvement. The last time that we saw uh, Natalie Portman try to lift a styrofoam hammer, it looked like she couldn't do it. She looks like she's probably been training for it. I still think Jane Foster Thor is a stupid direction to go with the movie, but it looked better than it should have. Yeah, it's a good shot. Uh, the armor looks good. Um, it does kind of obscure her face. So I know they're not doing the same storyline as they did in the comics where we didn't know who Jane, we didn't know who, you know, the new Thor was, we didn't know who had the hammer, um, until, uh, until later. Uh, and here, obviously we know, but I do think that the, the mask looks good. Um, it's, uh, it's a good look. It is weird to me as, as you said, that they're like adapting this story. Uh, there's so many good Thor stories throughout the history. There's so many good Marvel stories throughout the history of Marvel comics. And it seems weird that they're jumping right into the all new, all different Marvel so soon. I mean, in, uh, I, I, in, in my mind, I always thought when I saw all new, all different, I always thought that that was a Disney directive. I always thought that that was the, them saying you need to change these characters up because we don't want to pay these actors you know, exorbitant salaries as these films go on. We want to be able to replace them. Uh, so that always felt very, uh, very directed to me. And so that seems to be like what we're getting now is we're getting all the replacement heroes. Whether or not, I mean, people are going to show up to this movie to see Thor. They're coming to see Chris Hemsworth. Chris Hemsworth is a handsome dude. Women love him. Guys like him. He's proven that he's got really good comedy chops. He's got really good dramatic chops. So no matter like what they do with him, uh, he can handle it. And people like him. People want to see people want to see Thor. So the question of how well this movie is going to do, I'm sure it's going to have a great opening weekend as long as they, uh, you know, as long as they control what they show. But if this movie veers off into emasculating the character of Thor Odinson, if it replaces him with Jane by the end of the movie and he's no longer Thor and he goes off and he retires, I think that word of mouth will hit diminishing returns in the following weeks. So I, if, if that occurs, I don't think it'll be as successful as, uh, as previous movies or as they want it to be. Um, but if they, uh, if it ends with him being, Jedi. could be a yeah. last Jedi situation where all of a sudden it just dies immediately. Yeah. And then, uh, and then, you know, the next movie does terribly, <laughs> you know, does even worse, uh, because of it. Um, it's a bad direction to go in. People want Chris Evans as Captain America. People want Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. People want Chris Hemsworth as Thor. These are the characters that they're invested in. Uh, you're not going to be able to transfer them off. You know, we're seeing that the, these new heroes that they're trying to introduce are not doing as well. Uh, Shang-Chi, uh, for all of uh, Simu Liu's uh, online, uh, you know, bragging about getting a sequel, it was a flop. You know, it, it barely made any money. It made just enough money to get a sequel, but it, it wasn't a success. Uh, Eternals, horrible flop. Um, the Disney Plus shows, you know, we're not seeing a huge amount of excitement or, or hype or return on those. Uh, and, and word is that, uh, you know, each one is kind of hitting diminishing, uh, diminishing viewership. So the MCU is in a real weird place right now. This is their chance to course correct with, uh, with a character everybody likes, with an actor everybody likes. Uh, will they do it? I don't know. Well, and that's going to be coming hot on the heels, I believe, of Doctor Strange, the Multiverse of Madness, which is the follow-up to the Spider-Man No Way Home, which obviously sold like gangbusters. It broke records. The first real box office success after the COVID-19 stuff. And it showed there is still a fervent audience that is rabid for the MCU when it's done well. You go out there and put out Shang-Chi, it's going to be lukewarm. Some people are going to show up, but a lot of them are going to stay home. You come out with the Eternals, 
A lot of people are just going to stay home. You come out with a good Spider-Man movie, a character that they like, and it looks interesting, and you actually deliver on it, everyone's going to show up, and they're going to show up for two months. Yeah, and they're going to show up multiple times. I saw it a couple times, uh, you know, and and uh, I'll do the same with uh, with Doctor Strange if it uh, if it turns out to be good. Um, looks pretty good. I like the concept. I love Sam Raimi as a director. Uh, I really hope that they let him get his uh, get his hooks in there and do some of his stuff um, because we all know that the, the MCU is very very controlled and and kept very very safe. That's why. Um, the, uh, the director uh, that does the Spider-Man movies is so popular with them because he just doesn't do anything out of the box. It's all very flat, you know, exactly what you expect kind of kind of direction. But, you know, when you have a good story and you've got some nostalgia in there that makes everybody happy, you know, the movie does gangbusters. So keep your audience happy is the is the lesson there. And what will keep us happy? What will keep us happy is Chris Hemsworth as Thor. <laughs> this is a really important time for the MCU because we know the Fox acquisition happened. The Fantastic Four are going to be introduced. I'm imagining that's going to be in the Doctor Strange movie. The X-Men are about to be introduced. I imagine we're also going to get that, at least hints of it, within the Doctor Strange movie. So this is really going to be kicking off this next phase or uh, iteration of the MCU where the Avengers are no longer the focal point. I imagine it's going to initially be the Fantastic Four and potentially the X-Men after that. So they have a lot of stuff riding on these next few movies. And they better deliver what people actually want because you don't want to get the stink of the DCEU where people are coming in for one thing and they're just utterly disappointed by what they're getting in return for, for their dollars, which hasn't really happened all that often in the MCU. Even a movie like Captain Marvel, it's not all that great, but it's not that bad either. It was just it was a nice, boring superhero movie. Even on their worst stuff up until now, it just hasn't been terrible. Yeah, Captain Marvel felt like a, a 90s throwback, you know, not not just because they said it in the 90s, but it did feel like the kind of superhero movie that you got in the 90s. Um, and, and so, you know, it was just it was very I, I thought it was very bland, but I didn't think it was awful. Uh, if, if they, you know, Shang-Chi, I, I didn't care for um, Eternals. I couldn't even finish. Uh, I was so bored, you know, so it's it's one of those things where it's like, OK, you've got. The, the, the template of Spider-Man. I think that Spider-Man really kind of threw them back on their heels, you know, because right after that, we heard about massive reshoots for, for Dr. Strange. Uh, we heard about reshoots for, you know, Miss Marvel, you know, all the She-Hulk, all these, all these shows that they were doing, everything they was doing that was kind of pointing to what, what some people are calling the MCU. It seems like they went back and did a bunch of reshoots. So I think maybe they realized that, uh, you know, when you look at all the flops that are out there with, with female led reboots, like, uh, like Terminator, dark fate, uh, you know, the 2016 ghostbusters, all these things that they've tried to do where they've really pushed that angle and it hasn't worked because they're pushing angle before they're pushing story or they're pushing, you know, character. Uh, so you can, you can do a successful female led film. You know, we've seen many of them. There's many great ones out there, many great examples. Uh, but what comes first is comes, comes the story and then the character, and then the fact that just the character happens to be a woman. And that's always the best way to approach anything. It doesn't matter whether your character is a man or a woman, if it's a good character, and then you find the right person to play it. And then that it can go either way. So, uh, yeah, I think that uh, I think there's probably a lot of course correction going on. And I hope that they don't uh, I hope they don't get rid of Chris Hemsworth, because he's, he's said in some interviews, they don't seem too interested in working with him in the future. And that's crazy, because maybe the best part of the, the trailer besides him, well, even the montage stuff was good, but it's that Chris Pratt, Chris Hemsworth playing together, having fun and, and uh, kind of bouncing off each other with their comedy. Just even in the briefest moment, you can see there's a lot of chemistry there. Yeah, there's uh, they've both got you know really great comedy chops, and there's there's good chemistry. Uh, I, I laughed out loud at that moment in the trailer where Peter Quill's looking at you know the Guardians, and he's saying that you know got to keep your eyes focused on the things that you love. And then Chris Hemsworth's face like slowly comes into like comes into the frame. That cracked me up, and part of it is the way Chris Hemsworth sold it. His expression is so earnest, like he so wants to be part of this crew. <laughs> It really cracked me up. Uh, and, you know, yeah, if you've got, if you've got that kind of stuff going on, you know, those little, little good character bits, you know, they, they discovered Chris Hemsworth was, was good at comedy and they've just run with it. Well, they messed him up in that Ghostbusters movie. I mean, he was the funniest part about that Ghostbusters movie, but even there they ruined it. It's like, geez. Well, yeah, that movie had the problem of just rolling the cameras and yelling at your actors to say funny things and forcing them to ad lib for, you know, <laughs> tens of minutes. Um, you can't write well-constructed science jokes that way. You know, you can't write stuff that's rooted in the Ghostbusters universe. You're only going to have characters like making pop culture references and things like that. You know, he had some good bits in there, but uh, none of it was allowed to breathe. I mean, there's there's so many problems with that movie. You can't even. <laughs> that would be a whole other video. Was not a problem. 
No. He, was, he was just able to take the crap the best and, and at least make it work a little bit. Well, he's a leading man in every sense of the word. You know, it's uh, it's interesting because, you know, we're going to get Captain America 4 with Anthony Mackie as Captain America. And as much as I liked him as Falcon, I think Falcon and the Winter Soldier proved to me that he's not a leading man, at least not yet. Uh, he doesn't have that. Maybe it's the material, you know, and not necessarily him, but uh, it really didn't work. So I don't know how he's going to carry a Captain America movie. I don't know if people are going to show up. One of the real big issues going on with Disney right now is that their agenda appears to be trumping their customers at every single turn. I actually had this conversation with my good friend Neon from Clownfish TV a while back. Really good insight. Obviously, Neon worked with Disney for a really long time, been covering Disney on his channel. Definitely check this out and see what's going on at Disney right now.